Hello, my name is Leaf, and you're listening to Health Righteous. In our last episode, we took a look at five everyday foods that are trying to kill us. We learned the risks in foods like potatoes, tomatoes, portobello mushrooms, alfalfa sprouts, grapefruit, and how to minimize those risks. This week, we're diving into the deep, murky, cool waters of alcohol. Alcohol. It's embedded in our culture. It's a simple pleasure that adds joy to our lives, loosens us up in social situations, and adds value to our experiences. It's also a group one carcinogen in the same category as cigarettes. And according to a new study from the UK, drinking a bottle of wine per week may be like smoking five to 10 cigarettes in the same time period in terms of cancer risk. (coughs) But it's allegedly heart healthy. Is it? We'll get to that. First, let's talk about how it works. The alcohol in alcoholic drinks is what scientists will refer to as ethanol. When you're seeing 5% alcohol by volume, or 30% or so in spirits, that's what it's talking about. So you pour yourself a glass of wine, or a nice brandy, and start sipping. The alcohol enters your body, and right off the bat, your body releases an enzyme to start breaking it down into acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is the harmful part of this reaction. Acetaldehyde can cause mistakes in DNA, chromosome rearrangements, and can cause DNA to bind and form clumps. This is how cancer can form, but it's not the final stop on this train. If you're lucky, and are like most folks, another enzyme enters the equation and starts to turn the acetaldehyde into acetate, which is an energy the body can use. This happens a bit slower than the first half of the reaction, so the more you drink, the more acetaldehyde builds up before the body can process it, leaving your body more vulnerable to exposure to the acetaldehyde. If you've got a genetic variation in the second enzyme that breaks down alcohol, you'll probably drink less because you feel the alcohol's negative side effects such as nausea, headache, and flushing more readily. This is more common in Asian populations. So that's how the alcohol gets metabolized. But here's what happens to your brain. Since the ethanol molecule can freely diffuse across the blood-brain barrier, it goes straight to your head. Here's what's going on. Once your brain gets involved, there's two types of neurotransmitters that start to change. The first is called GABA. It's an inhibitory transmitter that's widely distributed and contributes to the motor control, vision, and other functions of your brain. It also regulates anxiety. So once the alcohol targets this neurotransmitter, The first thing it does is it starts by powering down your inhibitions, which is what we can give credit to for almost every cringeworthy wedding speech and the magic that keeps karaoke bars alive. Liquid courage. Next, it starts to inhibit emotional control. Think crying in public, falling in love on the dance floor, and then next, motor control, which is why you should never operate a vehicle after drinking, and then eventually breathing. But luckily, it takes a lot before it gets to that point. The other neurotransmitter is called glutamate. This is the excitatory transmitter associated with learning and memory. If you've ever experienced a blackout or a brownout, it's from the interaction of alcohol with this neurotransmitter. Also, I was surprised to find out that exposure to large amounts of alcohol doesn't necessarily kill brain cells like I thought. Instead, it just weakens these connections between these neurons that are crucial to learning and memory. And while these neurotransmitters are on the fritz, our mind gets blanketed with sweet, satisfying dopamine and serotonin. In fact, alcohol actually tends to activate the whole reward system, which is what makes the consumption of small doses of alcohol enjoyable. In the long term, These effects are also the basis for two of the defining characteristics of addiction, tolerance and dependence. So that's what's going on inside and upstairs. The World Cancer Research Fund notes that there is no safe amount of alcohol consumption, at least for some cancers, 
For cancer prevention, it's best not to drink alcohol. Drinking alcohol is a cause of cancers of the mouth, the pharynx and larynx, esophagus, liver, colon, stomach, and breast, both pre- and postmenopausal. Even as little as one glass of wine or beer each day increases the risk of breast cancer, according to data from roughly 12 million women. One of the best ways to lower the chances of getting breast cancer, though, is through vigorous exercise. But the data all points to the more you drink and the more often you drink, the greater the chances of getting these cancers. The likelihood of producing cancer is three and a half times greater in those who drink four or more drinks a day, one study found. A few other things to throw in there while we're at it. Alcohol is a causal factor in more than 200 disease and injury conditions. Drinking more than moderate amounts of alcohol on a routine basis can raise blood pressure and increase the risk of heart rhythm problems and failure. Three years ago, alcohol use was the leading risk factor for premature death and disability among people between the age of 15 and 49. For 20 to 39 year olds, about 13.5% of total deaths are alcohol attributable. In the past, Experts have focused on alcohol's harmful effects on young people whose brains are still developing, but now they're paying more attention to how alcohol affects the aging brain. With age, your ability to metabolize alcohol declines, so a drink or two in your 70s will raise your blood alcohol to a higher level than it did when you were in your 30s. So it's recommended that over the age of 65, you should limit alcohol use to no more than a single drink per day. My stance on the show has never been to tell you how to live your life. My stance is, and has always been, about harm reduction. Giving you the facts and letting you make the best decision for your own health. I just want to make sure that you have the tools so you're not sitting in the dark unknowingly putting yourself in harm's way. I, myself, enjoy an alcoholic beverage from time to time. But I took a year off to evaluate my relationship with alcohol which is actually what Harvard scientists recommend doing as well. Well, they don't recommend a year, but they recommend at least a few minutes. Dr. Monica Kolazedge is a psychologist who specializes in substance use disorders at the Harvard-affiliated McLean Hospital. If you drink even only occasionally, Dr. Kolazedge recommends taking a few minutes to think about when you drink alcohol and why. Maybe it's habit. Maybe you have a drink to cope with something that you might not want to confront. Some people drink to relieve anxiety and stress or to fall asleep. While alcohol does help you relax, remember that alcohol is a depressant and can leave you less motivated to deal with stress in a more effective, healthier way. Also, drinking before bed often disrupts sleep later in the night. And poor sleep and stress both contribute to heart disease. The point is to be more aware of your habits and patterns. Also, the amount that you're drinking might be more than you think. Even if you have one or two drinks, the actual volume of alcohol in your wine glass or tumbler may be considerably more. One drink might be six ounces of whiskey, which actually counts as four drinks. A number of mixed drinks such as martinis and margaritas can also have more than one type and serving of alcohol. A standard serving size of alcohol is 12 ounces of beer, 5 ounces of table wine, 8 to 9 ounces of malt liquor, or a 1.5 ounce shot of distilled spirits. Luckily, nowadays, even though we're confronted with a ton of alcohol marketing, there's been a recent cultural shift to go lower carb, or to be sober curious, taking time off for sober October, November, or December. Or the Whole30 diet, which calls for no alcohol for 30 days. Here's a couple tips for cutting back. Try a drinking diary. Write down what and how much you drink for a couple weeks to get a sense of how much you usually imbibe. Keep alcohol out of your house. This can help you limit your drinking to restaurants and social occasions. Dilute and drink slowly. Dilute your wine or cocktail with sparkling water and ice. Maybe one of those gigantic ice cubes that they put in whiskey sometimes. Sip it slowly. Drink one and one. Make sure that you're drinking a glass of water in between each beverage. In the great words of Lizzo, water me. Stay hydrated. It's better for your body and it's better for your skin. 
Other things to consider. Only drink when you're eating. Don't drink on an empty stomach. And establish alcohol-free days. Choose a few days per week to completely abstain from alcohol. Or another less harmful substitute might be to opt for cannabis instead. I'm going to rattle off some quick information about marijuana here. There haven't been any reported deaths as a result of marijuana. Apparently, it doesn't affect your body the same way as tobacco smoke, because it doesn't pose any increase in risk of lung, neck, or head cancers. It can mess up your balance, it can distort your sense of time, it can turn your eyes red. You shouldn't drive when you're under the influence of marijuana. It might affect your sperm count, affect your pregnancy, exacerbate social anxiety, increase likelihood of depression or schizophrenia, and affect how your brain forms memories. But it could also relieve certain types of pain and arthritis, help with IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, help with epileptic seizures, improve some types of physical performance, and make you less likely to be physically violent in a romantic setting whereas alcohol has the opposite effect. And it'll give you the munchies. Surprisingly, it's actually more likely to experience weight gain from alcohol versus the munchies you might get from marijuana. One thing to look out for though is if you're a long-term heavy marijuana user is cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. This condition is classified by repeated and severe bouts of vomiting. It is rare and only occurs in daily long-term users of marijuana and goes away in a couple days to a month or so once you stop taking marijuana. Wow. All right, let's take a commercial break, and when we get back, we'll talk about the relationship between alcohol and heart health, and some of the more colorful sides of alcohol. Today's sponsor is me. I started this podcast to share my knowledge about the things that matter to me when it comes to making health-conscious decisions. I believe that everyone should have the tools to make their best decisions to reduce harm from their lives so they get the best chance at living a long, happy one. Even if we're just making a difference in the life of one person who listens to this podcast, that to me is worthwhile. This podcast is currently a solo project and it's pretty resource and time consuming. So if you believe in what I'm doing, or you just want to pick up some tips about how to add some health righteousness to your everyday life, follow Health Righteous on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or visit our website. Just type Health Righteous, all one word, into your browser and drop a dot before the US. And if this podcast means something to you, share it with somebody. Share it with somebody who you want to see live a health righteous life. And lastly, if you want to help me make this podcast sustainable, visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash health righteous. Any amount that you can contribute, even if it's just a few dollars, will help secure the resources we need to make this podcast something I can feasibly continue. Let's spread the gospel. All right, back to the show. It feels like it's common knowledge at this point that a glass of wine or a single serving of alcohol has heart-healthy effects and can reduce the likelihood of heart disease. I was definitely under that impression when I started researching this topic. But maybe unsurprisingly, this isn't actually the case. The common case that people know about is the French paradox in which French people have lower rates of heart disease despite their luxurious, butter-heavy diet. Further studies found the paradox to be an illusion, a distortion, a result of inconsistent disease reporting and other factors. Observational studies showing that moderate drinkers tend to have lower rates of heart disease do exist, but those studies can't prove cause and effect. One of the primary studies compared drinkers to non-drinkers. Light to moderate drinkers tend to be educated and relatively well off so they're more likely to have heart-healthy habits that may explain their lower risk. In addition, non-drinkers may have made the choice to stop drinking because of an underlying health condition, which can also confound the results. But it's not just a flawed observational study. Researchers at the National Institute of Health, or NIH, which is generally regarded as a reputable science authority, persuaded alcohol industry executives to fund them by creating a trial that, quote, represents a unique opportunity to show that moderate alcohol consumption is safe and lowers risk of common diseases, before they had even enrolled their first patient. 
The trial was supposed to answer the age-old question of whether moderate drinking truly reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. But news eventually broke that Anheuser-Busch InBev, Heineken, Diageo, Pernod Ricard, and Carlsberg helped pay $67 million of the $100 million government study. The study is not public health research, it's marketing. And it's a clear depiction of funding bias in which scientists readily present data that will appease their corporate funders. If you've been following this season of my podcast, you're aware that this isn't the first time that corporate interests have turned to scientists to produce data that supports their bottom line. <clears throat> Pesticides, herbicides. There are a couple other instances in which marketing played a major role in how we perceive the healthiness of food. Chocolate demand has continued to rise year over year consistently, despite the bad press that it has received on unregulated child labor, dangerous and unsustainable working conditions, and the effect of added sugar and fat in a time of rising obesity and diabetes. This is thanks in large part to the fact that companies like Nestle, Mars, Berikalabout, and Hershey's, some of the world's biggest producers of chocolate, have poured millions of dollars into scientific studies and research grants that support cocoa science. Mars specifically has funded over 100 studies which help transform the image of chocolate to having health-promoting properties like flavonoids, which are antioxidants with anti-inflammatory and immune system benefits. But more likely than not, the studies that they're performing are on cocoa, not milk chocolate. And the amount of cocoa required to see any of these benefits is considerably higher than you would get from a standard serving of chocolate. Again, this is marketing appearing as science. I have an app called the FEP Chocolate List on my iPhone that gives me an idea of which chocolates meet ethical standards. But speaking of antioxidants, the reason we even know what they are is thanks to the marketing efforts of the Wild Blueberry Association of North America. In 1996, the executive director heard about a small study in which blueberries were improving memory and balance in rats. Upon finding that blueberries were the fruit with the highest amount of antioxidants, higher than pomegranate or acai, he and the blueberry industry began funding research that would highlight the health effects of blueberries. And between the years of 1996 and 1999, sales of wild blueberries went from 2 million pounds to 30 million pounds. His idea was that if it's the best at something, it's probably worth investigating what makes it special. He brought the term antioxidant to the mainstream. He basically invented it. And the North American blueberry supply has risen to about one and a half billion pounds annually. Piggybacking on the success of the new buzzword is the Palm Wonderful brand of pomegranate juice. Palm spent about $34 million in medical research to help substantiate their health claims, but ultimately, a Supreme Court judge sided with the Federal Trade Commission, or FTC's, ruling saying that the company's ads had overhyped Palm's ability to prevent heart disease, prostate cancer, and erectile dysfunction ED. Palm falls under the same family of brands as Fiji Water, Halos, formerly known as Cuties, and Wonderful Pistachios. The billionaire couple that owns the wonderful brand is the world's biggest producers of pistachios and almonds. They're also one of the biggest users of water in California, and possibly the biggest irrigated farmers in the world. They're so thirsty for water that the wonderful company have come into controversy for growing some of its crops where oil companies like Chevron dispose of oil field wastewater into the agricultural irrigation systems which puts toxic chemicals into the soil that the crops are growing out of. My first instinct was to dismiss these billionaires, Linda and Stuart Resnick, as just another industrial farm with no morals. But despite these missteps, these billionaires have actually done some great things. Most recently, a couple months ago, they donated $750 million to Caltech for climate change research and sustainability on top of the more than $300 million in sustainability research and clean energy measures they had previously reported having donated to various causes. This is the second largest gift to an educational institution ever, 
after Michael Bloomberg, who donated $1.8 billion to John Hopkins University just last year. The wonderful company also held an inaugural plant-based nutrition leadership symposium in LA this year, where they had nutritionists on hand to help debunk myths and rumors about plant-based nutrition. They also raise minimum wages to $15 for all of their workers and are actively working towards 100% renewable energy locally by 2025 and globally by 2040. This is either all just really good PR or they might have a conscience. And this just illustrates how things aren't always good or bad. Sometimes they can kind of fall in the middle. The last science washing of branding I want to mention before we get back to alcohol is vitamin C. I immediately think of the 90s pop singer, but that's not what this is about. Linus Pauling is a double Nobel Prize winning chemist and the author of Vitamin C and the Common Cold, where he encouraged Americans to consume 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C daily after a man at one of his lectures recommended it to him to improve his longevity. He experienced a relief from regular illness and became obsessed with it. After the world got a hold of his book, the claim became as good as fact, and sales of vitamin C supplements went through the roof. Actual scientific data later on from reviewing nearly 30 studies looking at people with colds taking the normal daily dose of vitamin C found that it reduced colds lengths by just 8%. This means if your cold lasts five days, it might be shortened by about 10 hours. The idea that it'll do nearly anything for our colds is a myth that persists, and one that supplement companies have no problem perpetuating. There's still a massive market for products like Emergency, which its site assures will boost the immune system and enhance energy a statement their site notes has not been regulated by the FDA. The supplement industry, at least as of 2012, racked in $23 billion in consumer spending. Speaking of supplements, there's one country in which what can be added into beer virtually hasn't changed for centuries. In Germany, the country synonymous with beer a 500-year-old tradition remains, and that's regarding what ingredients are allowed to be used in the process of brewing beer. The German beer purity law, or Reinheitsgebot, has been enforced since 1516, and it limits the ingredients used to brew beer to water, barley or malt, and hops. It was originally in place to keep wheat and rye available to bread makers, and to prevent people from using dangerous additives as they push the boundaries of flavor and integrity. It has been extended only slightly over the years to include a few more things, like yeast, once they discovered its role, coriander, bay leaf, and then wheat again due to the popularity among royalty. You might know it as Hefeweizen. It was the first style to receive an exemption. The way the Germans have continued to produce interesting beers is through the introduction of more exotic wild yeasts, or hop varieties that when combined, continue to produce unique flavor profiles. There are rebel brewers who don't abide by the rule and use things like chocolate, orange rind and sugar, but they can't market these products as beer. Instead, they have to call them by the name of the specific style, IPA or stout for example, and market them as Biermischgetränke mixed beer drinks. Still, according to The Guardian, 85% of Germans still trust in the German beer purity law. And I can get down with that. It might be harsh, but consider the alternative. In some commercially produced alcohol, there have also been reports of above trace levels of arsenic, benzene, formaldehyde, lead, and other contaminants. And without labeling transparency, American consumers will never be the wiser. Other beers might contain rice, corn, high fructose corn syrup, and stabilizers like propylene glycol. Doing a quick Google search of beers that contain high fructose corn syrup could be illuminating. But what about wine? There are all kinds of additives to make wine palatable, ranging from mega purple to Zymo clear. Here's what I learned. 
There's a lot of variables in winemaking that, with help controlling, can make for a more stable, drinkable wine. But there are also some not-so-good practices. Remember that grapes are on the dirty dozen list of pesticide-heavy produce? Well, unfortunately, the organic alternative might not be great either. In organic farming, it's common practice to use copper sulfate, also known as the Bordeaux mixture, to reduce mildew or remove impurities in the fining process of the wine. This toxic mixture can contaminate the soil and end up in unknown quantities in the final product of the wine. I thought sulfites played a role in hangovers when I started this research, but a handful of dried apricots contains about five times more sulfites than a glass of wine, and most people don't get hangovers off of dried fruit. So what causes the hangover? Likely a combination of dehydration, since alcohol suppresses your body's antidiuretic hormone that sends fluid back into your system, while also acting as a diuretic. It also induces inflammation, sleep disturbances like I mentioned earlier, and drops in blood sugar, which can all prompt or exacerbate hangover symptoms. Luckily, in biodynamic farming, copper sulfate use is minimized. Biodynamic farming is a complex, full-scale approach to farming that involves planting and harvesting on a lunar cycle, composting, and a number of other natural methods, and it predates modern organic farming by about 20 years. There are only two dynamic certifiers in place today. Another thing to note about wine that I didn't know most of my life is that there are a number of animal-based ingredients that could be used in wine production, and although they may not appear in the final product, they can make the wine non-vegan friendly. Ingredients like egg whites, gelatin, milk protein, and fish bladder, also known as isinglass, are commonplace in the finding process of wine. Head to barnivore.com or download the Veggie Beers app to find out if your wine is vegan, if you're into that kind of thing. What about liquor? Is liquor vegan? Probably. Distilling is the standard way to remove impurities from most shelf spirits. Unless there's a worm in your tequila, the most common non-vegan ingredient I've seen is milk-based liqueurs, but even Bailey's has come out with an almond-based cream liqueur that's suitable for vegans. In the spirit realm, I feel like tequila definitely gets the best press. Spirit realm, see what I did there? First of all, tequila is low carb. In theory, yes. Typically, tequila, if it's made from 100% agave, will be no carb, and will have under 100 calories per shot. But not all tequila is made from 100% agave. In fact, if it doesn't say 100% agave, it can be made with up to 49% high fructose corn syrup, which could skew the carb content. But also, rum, vodka, gin, and whiskey all typically have no carbs as well. Second, tequila is a probiotic. This is actually false. The myth of tequila supporting our microbiome began when scientists theorized that blue agave nectar could be a source of dietary fiber. Fiber does help promote the health of the microbiome, but blue agave nectar doesn't have nearly enough fiber to promote the health of our intestines. In fact, alcohol can disrupt the lining of your intestinal wall, allowing bacteria to get in promoting leaky gut and inflammation. Instead, look at beans, lentils, berries, nuts, and whole grains for better sources of fiber that have been shown to promote the growth of good bacteria in our intestines. Third, tequila is a stimulant. Again, this is not true. As I mentioned earlier, ethanol is a depressant. Any stimulant qualities you might experience from drinking tequila likely just come from the depressing of inhibition. And there you have it, I think that's all the alcohol-related info I've got for you today. It takes work to stay on top of the facts these days, but I am glad you're along for the ride with me. If you learned something today, and you want to share it with someone, pass this podcast along to your friends, your family, your table tennis rival, your gymnastics coach, your babysitter, your best friend's grandma, or anyone who's made your life interesting that you want to have the best shot at living a long, healthy life. Or maybe you just want to remind someone that drinking isn't always fun. It is still possible to go out to the bars and not drink. Believe me, I am a nightlife DJ, and it is a rare occasion when I decide to knock one back. Partying can still exist without alcohol. Either way, your support, you matter to me. Follow Health Righteous on Instagram, Facebook, 
Twitter, YouTube, visit our website, type Health Righteous into your browser, all one word, and drop a dot before the US. Join the movement. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts to let me know what you think of the work I'm doing. Give me some stars, drop me some words, lift this baby up Lion King style. I'd love to keep making these episodes, so consider becoming a patron. I'm currently accepting patrons on Patreon and sponsorship of many kinds, so visit patreon.com slash healthrighteous or shoot me a DM. And big shout out to my first patrons on Patreon. Shout out to my lifelong friend, Stephanie Fisher, and a friend who never misses a beat in supporting a great cause, Marcy Kester. And, of course, I'd like to thank my boyfriend, Duncan Clark Menzies, for making sure that I know that I am loved and supported. Thank you for listening. It's a demonstration of self-love and self-kindness. Now get out of here and tell the world how great this podcast is. Come back in two weeks and we're going to take a look at diets. From vegan to keto to paleo to FODMAP and even eating to your blood type. Until next time, my name is Leaf and this has been Hell.